The, <coughs> the, the HTML iframe element represents a nested browsing context, which, if my screen goes on, because I couldn't remember this by, by head, effectively embedding another HTML page into the current page. In HTML 4.01, a document may contain a head and a body, or a head and a frame set, but not both a body and a frame set. However, an iframe can be used to <coughs> within a normal bo uh, document body. Each browsing context has its own session history and active document. The browsing context that contains the embedded content is called the pairing browser, parent browsing context. The top-level browsing context, which has no parent, is typically called the browser window. All right. My name is Peter, and I'm going to talk about iframes today. My voice is uh, crappy. I'm getting a cold or a flu or whatever it is, and uh, high-pitched sounds are going to be muted, muted. So sorry about that. Um, so Peter Van Der Zee, uh, also known as QVOS, QFOX, that JS1K guy, or hey, I don't rem really remember your name, but your face is awkwardly familiar. Um, I'm a JavaScript developer, I freelance, I work from home remotely, and I work for international companies. Um, apart from that, I'm married, I've got a kid, and I love playing games, both uh, board games and video games. So there's that. So iframe. Um, when, you, when you look online and search for the definition of an iframe, uh, you find various names uh, like inline, flame, uh, inline frame, floating frame, or inline floating frame. Um, I reached out to Scott Isaacs, who is the, uh, the, was described to be the inventor of the iframe, and he worked at Microsoft at the time. Now, it took me a, a while to get in touch with him, and um, he got back to me at the last moment, so I wasn't really able to uh, transcribe that back into it, so I just uh, pasted what he, he responded. You can read it later in the slides that I'll post. Um, but it comes down to the fact that um, he's a little bit disappointed with the fact that it's, you know, people are mostly interested in the iframe, uh, opposed to all the other things that he did. Uh, but the bottom line is, uh, there was a uh, rumor that the name was actually called the Isaacs frame, um, but he says it's, it's literally just inline frame, so there's that. Now, I'm not going to really give you a history lesson of the iframe or whatever I think you've had enough history for today. So uh, we're just going to dig into the attributes of the iframe. Um, the scope of the iframe, uh, the scope of the talk was uh, uh, not given really, so it's, it's a bit difficult because there is, there is a lot of things to explain about the iframe, and I just really don't have enough time. I, actually, they were uh, great for giving me another 15, uh, 15 minutes to talk extra, uh, but even that's not really going to cover it. So let's just dig into it. Um, the idea, by the way, is to uh, uh, give you an overview or a quick overview of the, uh, uh, of the attribute for as far as you need them. Uh, but mainly, uh, I'm going to try and teach you something new and interesting about each attribute. Um, and hopefully, by the end of the talk, you'll get away with at least one thing. And uh, I think many of you might actually get away with many new uh, small edge cases or things that you may have not have known before. So there you go. Um, align. Align, so align is for horizontal alignment, and it was specced in HTML3. It was um, uh, deprecated in HTML4 and then even obsolete in HTML5. So they really wanted to get rid of it, but it still works. Um, it's specced to have four different values, left, right, center, and justify. Uh, left and right work. They work the same as like image does, uh, which means that the text will flow, uh, flow around it on the left or the right side, depending on the value. Uh, center, you would expect the iframe to be centered, uh, much like image used to do, uh, but in fact it will vertically align the first line of text uh, to the left or the right of, uh, of the iframe. I don't, have no idea what justify was supposed to do. It doesn't appear to do anything right now. What What's kind of weird for me is that it actually isn't horizontal alignment. It will accept a bunch of um, default or de facto uh, vertical alignment keywords, uh, but not all of them, because like super and sub, the, it doesn't support that. Uh, but these, uh, the ones on this list, I've tested them, and they do work. So I've made a, a small demo. Uh, all of this stuff is going to be on GitHub, so you can check it out for yourself. Uh, I only checked for Chrome and Firefox because I, I run Linux, and um, uh, Internet Explorer or Edge or uh, Safari is going to be difficult to run there. And honestly, uh, two browsers are already enough to, uh, to, to fill this talk. So um, this is Chrome. Uh, the most peculiar one is the fact that center is going to be the same as middle. Uh, sorry, no, apps middle. Uh, you can see, you can orient yourself by the lines. Uh, you can see that it's, uh, for, for uh, Chrome, it, the center is apps middle. But if you look at Firefox, uh, everything else is the same. So if I, if I quickly just jump between them, uh, there's little difference apart from the text jumping because, you know, line height or whatever it is. Um, but the uh, center for Firefox, this is Firefox, I think it, there's some, okay, the top's cropped off. This is Firefox, yeah. Um, it's going to be the same as middle. 
Why is it different? I don't know, but it's obviously different because the, the, uh, the middle and the apps middle have a slightly different offset. So if you're pixel perfect, this is going to screw you. Don't use a line. All right, full screen. So there's a full screen API, in case you don't know, in JavaScript, uh, which is an HTML5 API, uh, which allows you to put any element or request to have any element to be full screened. Um, for iframes, however, uh, they default to not allowing that because it's a security risk, of course. Uh, otherwise, any advertisement would be able to, do, to take a full screen takeover um, without paying for it, or a malicious code could do a drive-by attack or whatever. So by default, it's not allowed, but if you would like to do this uh, and explicitly want to allow uh, the full screen API to be used, you can set this attribute uh, and it will work. It's inherited, um, and the thing that, that I found a little weird, uh, which is just a matter of choice, I suppose, is that it's not true or false, it's not zero or one, it's either the attribute has to exist without a value, or its value has to be the own keyword, uh, the own attribute name, I mean. So that was, I don't know, it's weird. Um, it also taints the tree, so if you have nested iframes, and one of them doesn't have this keyword, then none of the iframes can actually use it. On to border. Border is a simple one, right? You either set a zero or one, um, and you get a border, or you don't get a border. Except, no, it's not, because it's actually, and it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's not cropped, OK. Um, it actually only works on image, table, and object. Um, for frames, you use frame border. <laughs> border actually did, really just does nothing. Um, and you can't even reliably use this, because between Chrome and Firefox, uh, the behavior is already different. So this is Chrome. Um, and uh, it, the verticals is the different values for border and horizontally, uh, sorry, the other way around. Horizontally, you can see the different values for, for frame border, and vertically, you can see the different values for border. Um, and most notably, uh, it's a bit cropped. I have no idea why that is, by the way, but whatever. Uh, that in Chrome, by default, if you don't specify the frame border, uh, it will render a frame border. And if you explicitly set it to one, it will render a frame border. But anything else by default, or the default value for Chrome, is that it doesn't render a frame border. Whereas if you look at Firefox, this is Firefox, uh, it will do the opposite way. And this, uh, this distinction is mainly, I think, but, uh, due to the way that uh, the two browsers handle the default value for attributes. Uh, because if you set it but don't set a value to it, it will still uh, set it to 1. And apparently for Firefox, the default is 1. And Chrome, the default is 0. So um, frame border, don't use it. Width and height. Well, width and height is interesting. Um, you may think it's, uh, you know, it's a pretty dry and cut. You just set width and height. Actually, just don't use it. Uh, but it depends, because in HTML4, it was expected to be either percentage-based explicitly or implicitly pixels otherwise. In HTML5, it's implicitly pixels regardless of the suffix. But it gets worse. Um, if you do add a suff suffix, regardless of what it is, it will still interpret it as pixels. It will just drop the suffix. So it will, it will pretty much do the same thing as parsing does. Uh, parsing in JavaScript, it takes the numbers up until the point where it's not a number, and then it converts that number into a, an integer, and that's that. Um, for this algorithm, does pretty much the same thing, and that says that resulting number is the pixels. So the width and the height are going to be um, in pixels regardless of what you do. Uh, you can check this out later. Same in Firefox, there's no discrepancy between the two for width and height. Long desk. This is actually an attribute I didn't know. I've never used it, uh, and I have to investigate it. Uh, and when I did, I was surprised to see that it actually is an URL. I mean, long desk for me would say this is like alt on an image, right? Um, and it kind of is, in, except that it's, it's the, the contents of the alt is ref, uh, referenced in a, a URL. Um, so I was afraid it was going to actually download a URL. Like, what is this like a, a, a weird attack vector I've never heard of? Uh, but the, I couldn't trigger the current browsers uh, to download this, uh, this resource in any kind of way that I tested. So that's at least something. Um, but the thing that did blew my mind is I found an article on, MD, uh, MD, uh, on MSDN uh, where it said that you could actually uh, do the same thing you can do for anchor tags, right? You can, in an anchor tag, you can set a, a URL, a relative URL, and if you read it out, you can get the absolute URL. Uh, you can do the same thing for, uh, for long desk. And you may think that's not really, really relevant, I work for a company called Surfly, and they do like a sandbox uh, in a browser kind of thing. For them, this kind of stuff is super important because this would allow them uh, allow users to break out of the sandbox. So um, it might be it might look minor, but it could be a, a serious problem to at least a subset of, of companies or people or whatever. Long desk, don't use it. It's deprecated. <coughs> it's deprecated. Uh, margin width and margin height. Now, raise your hand, be honest here. Who thinks this is correct? Who thinks this is conceptually what margin width and margin height on an iframe would do? Honestly, nobody? 
Oh, come on. I, I, I find it hard to believe. It doesn't. Anyways, um, it's the inset. It's like a, uh, more like padding, except it isn't padding because you can override it with the child frame, uh, but you have to do it explicitly because if you don't, then you're pretty much left over to whatever uh, the frame's gonna, gonna give you. So if you're a framed content uh, and you don't send the margin, your, your content might be pushed out of the frame. Um, I found that interesting because why, why, would, uh, why would you spec it uh, to have that kind of control over an iframe uh, where everything else is patched down? So uh, this is what it looks like on Chrome, and there is a, uh, this is Firefox, and you can see it jumps, and it's the same kind of default behavior um, I would say that uh, the, you, you can see the default on the top left, but you can't. Uh, but the M&M is about 9 pixels to the bottom if it's the default value. Um, and the only difference, or the only main uh, difference here is that uh, Firefox now decides to parse the 50% as an invalid value and will just reset and default to, zero, uh, to 9 pixels. So uh, Firefox has different behavior for margin width and height, uh, opposed to width and height itself, where it does actually accept the 50% 50 uh, of those pixels. So I, that was weird. I, I'm expecting this is a bug because this is highly inconsistent, um, and I don't expect them to want to have this different behavior. Um, margin width, margin height, don't use it. It's deprecated. Name. So um, this is the real first rabbit hole. Um, so the name, the main use of name is so that you can use the iframe as a target uh, for uh, forms and links. Now, this was the onset of the whole Ajax movement and the whole, uh, you know, single page application kind of thing. Um, and it's cool, it's great. I, I, I remember using it myself and, you know, having the first time the form submit there without reloading my page. Awesome. Um, you can't hijack certain keywords. There are four uh, parent, uh, there's underscore parent, underscore blank, underscore uh, new, and underscore self. Uh, they pretty much, well, no, they're not so self-explanatory. Uh, blank will always open in a new window, always open in a new window regardless, uh, whereas self will open in the same frame as you click in. Uh, parent will try to do the parent frame, um, and top will always go to the top frame. And parent and top can be the same thing, but don't need to be. Um, so unknown names open in a new window, and uh, so, uh, for, for a long time people thought that underscore new was actually one of those special keywords uh, because it had the special behavior, uh, but then it turned out that it's just a random name, and random names that aren't resolved to any frame with that name uh, open in a new window. Uh, and if you open them in a new window, it will remember that name, so anything else that targets the same name will open in that same window, unlike blank, which will open always in a new window regardless. Um, other weird behavior of target is that it will try to find the first element um, in the tree, in its children first, and then it will go up to its parent and, and, and you know, search for the other trees, uh, for the other children from its parent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, target is like, it's, it's kind of complex. Um, this is the list that the spec gives you. It's, uh, it's excavated, no, excavated, it's, uh, it's made worse by the fact that there's also seamless, uh, which is kind of irrelevant, but there's also sandbox, uh, which does make it kind of worse. Um, but still, uh, despite those two uh, uh, alternatives, the actual behavior of target is just complex. So this is a simple test case I created, and uh, you can, well, you know, you'll have to take my word for it, of course. Uh, you can see that I was able to use uh, the name uh, without a name, uh, without the attribute, you can't target it. Without a value, you can't target it. So you can't target undefined and hope that it will uh, fetch an iframe without a value. It just won't work. Empty string uh, also won't work. Name and foo. Name is not special, so that's fine. Um, you can't override blank, target, self, parent, and top. You can use new. Uh, again, it's not special. It's not protected in any way. Um, you can easily use emoji or whatever. It doesn't care. Uh, the interesting fact there is that it doesn't have to be a, a, a regular identifier like ID has to be. Uh, it will work with pretty much anything. Uh, Firefox and Chrome do the same thing, and the second row of, uh, of iframes was to show that it will only open in one and not in like multiples or other weird behavior. Um, I went further. I created a test case where there was a page with three iframes, each with three iframes, each with three iframes. Um, that amounts to a total of 39 iframes. It's very smart counting of you. And this is kind of what it looks like in, the, in, a, uh, uh, in a graph. And all those iframes have the same name. So or uh, all those items have the same name, they have a form, and whenever you click on the form and it targets that name, it will open in itself, because itself is the first, the first frame it found, found with that name. So then I figured, okay, let's make a new test case and have just one iframe, that circled, circled iframe, and just say, that, okay, you know, that iframe has the name X, all the other frames, iframes have no name, now what happens? And it turns out that all the iframes, all the, the, the forms in every iframe will target that one iframe. Okay. 
Even like the, the, the most left node, or you know, it will go up and down, up and down. And actually, it gets worse because if you do a cross domain uh, parent of that iframe, so that R1, the one in, in the top of the circle, is a cross domain frame, and so all the siblings are supposed to be cross domain in some way, uh, but they will still target it. You can still click anywhere in this tree, any iframe, and it will, uh, uh, it will open uh, its target in that iframe. It's like, okay, that's. I, I was not expecting that. Like I was expecting some kind of cross-domain protection or anything like that. Um, this is what that looked like. The uh, uh, the yellow, the middle one is the the, the cross-domain one, and then the orange one has the uh, name X. You can check it out later. Um, yeah. So there's X XHTML. Of course, we we don't really talk about that. Uh, but the fact here is. XHTML actually deprecated name in favor of ID. And this is why for a long time you, uh, might, encounter, you might have encountered uh, the fact that you needed to do ID and name for the same thing. Tooling would do this. They would add uh, uh, duplicate uh, attributes like ID and name for the same value. And you were like, well, why would you do that? This is the reason. XHTML uh, deprecated name and you needed to do ID with the same name to get backwards compatibility. All right, refer policy. That's one of the newest ones, uh, one of the newer HTML5 things. Um, refer policy kind of determines what the refer URL will be if you uh, request a resource or if your browser requests a resource uh, anywhere on the page. Uh, there's a variety of ways of setting it, and there's a variety of values to set to it. So, no, oh, sorry. There is uh, the no refer, which obviously will never send a refer if that's the, if that's the, the, the active value. No refer when downgrade means if you go from HTTPS to HTTP, it will not send a refer, but in, in HTTP to HTTP and HTTPS, HTTP, blah, 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 whatever. If it's the same, it, it will send a refer. If it goes down, then it won't send a refer. Same origin uh, will pretty much not send the, the refer if you go uh, uh, cross origin. And origin is actually the one that's confusing because it has nothing to do with cross origin. Instead, it will force the origin, uh, sorry, it will force the refer to be like a trimmed, a slimmed down version of that refer. Uh, it will remove the path and will only send the, uh, the schema, so the HTTP or HTTPS, the domain and subdomains, and the port, uh, but it will drop the path. Now then there's uh, origin when cross origin, which means it will, it will send that slimmed down uh, version of the refer when you go down, uh, oh sorry, when you do cross domain. And then there's unsafe URL, which means just always send a refer. And then there are some edge cases with the empty string and the uh, and no value, which I won't even bother you with. Then there's the inherited tree. So the way, the way that uh, the refer policy is set is through about five different different methods. Uh, for one, there's the HTTP header. So the server header that sends it to your browser can already set the uh, refer policy. Uh, and it will actually do this with redirects. So that's, I, I, I think it's kind of interesting. If your initial request uh, had a refer policy but it was redirected to another resource, it will still be applied if nothing else in the page overrides it. Uh, the second way is to have a meta. Uh, and the meta name is actually refer, not refer policy. No idea why, but I think there, there was like an older spec, uh, and the older spec uh, mainly uh, mentioned refer, uh, and it had like simple keywords like never and always and, uh, and default and origin, I think it was. Um, and I think that's where that name comes from. So if you, wanted, if you want to put a meta, it ha you have to put it in, your, uh, in, your, in, the, head of the, body, uh, in the head of the document, um, and it has to be named refer, but the keywords are the same. Uh, the next one is then the attribute. Uh, there's an attribute on a subset of, of tags uh, that can allow to it, uh, that can, they are allowed to have it, um, and you can set the refer policy explicitly that way. Um, and then the last way is only for anchors and for area, where you can set a no refer and it will just not send the refer. Alternatively, if nothing is set in any of those ways, it will still try to uh, fetch that refer policy from the parent and inherit it that way. So. Uh, it's, it's, it gets kind of complex, but at the same time, um, this is one of the new specs. Support is not that great. Um, it might look good here, uh, but in Firefox, it's actually uh, only on the red flag. If you look at Chrome here, uh, what you're seeing here is uh, uh, three rows. The first row is the same domain, and the second row is a cross domain over a different port, and then the third one is a cross domain over a different domain. Uh, the red one means there is no refer, and then the orange one means uh, that you get the origin URL, so the, 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 the trim down URL. Uh, Chrome will support most of these things out of the box. Uh, I think the most interesting one is the, uh, the, is the column number seven, where it says origin when cross origin, which of course does work here. Uh, in Firefox, I had, to, I had to enable the flag. I'm not sure, maybe that changed in, in recent days, but in my experiments, I had to do that. Um, which also indicates that it may not be that reliable just yet. Like, you can't rely on it because it may not work. 
Um, but when you enable the flag, it will support the origin and it will support no referrer, but it will not support those old keywords like never, um, and it will not support the origin and cross origin. Um, if you serve it from HTTPS, this is from Dropbox, uh, Dropbox will actually send that uh, refer, uh, a refer policy in the HTTP header, which is why most of these fields are red, um, because they are, uh, all the, the ones that are red mostly are invalid or crappy uh, values, and so it will refer back to the, uh, the one that was specified in the HTTP, HTTPS header. Well, HTTP header, I guess. Um, Firefox. Uh, no, sorry, this is GitHub. Oh, sorry, uh, Firefox does the same thing, but it supports fewer keywords, and so you'll see the no referrer header more often. Um, if you have servants from GitHub pages, which doesn't actually send that uh, uh, referrer policy, you'll see that you see more greens because you get the complete header in more cases. Uh, by the way, all the center ones are gray because uh, HTTP content is simply no longer downloaded by your browser uh, if you're on HTTPS. So uh, that spec for like uh, when you downgrade, it's not really relevant anymore, I think. Or maybe it's just uh, in a different case that I'm not uh, or haven't really uh, thought about. All right, scrolling, uh, back to the interesting, con uh, the interesting part of the specs. Scrolling uh, defines whether or not you want on a, a scroll bar on your content. Um, they can be short about this. This is a very simple one. There is one case where it overrides it, and uh, in that circled one, when uh, you specify no scrolling, it will remove the scroll bar and actually override the CSS that's inside of the uh, frame. It will do this in Firefox and Chrome, so it's not just a, a single browser bug. Uh, weird, like the, you could actually control the scroll bar stuff from the parent frame. Uh, I would not expect that. Scrolling, uh, I'm pretty sure it's deprecated, don't use it. <coughs> Sorry, that's loud. Uh, the next one, Sandbox, HTML5. Um, sandbox is actually interesting. Sandbox is, the, is one of the new spiffy things that's supposed to beef your security, and it will, it does, if it works. Uh, Support is, well, we'll see that in a second. Um, the, there are like nine values, if I remember correctly, uh, that you can set on Sandbox. Uh, the first one is allow forms, which basically just determines whether or not you can submit a form. Not so much place it, but whether, you, whether submit actually does anything. Uh, then there's allow modals, which is like the alert and confirm stuff from JavaScript. Uh, if this, uh, this value is not present, oh, by the way, uh, if values are not present, they are off by default. So uh, this is like an opt-in for uh, for stuff, but as soon as you don't use Sandbox, it's automatically opt-in, so it's kind of confusing that way. But if you use Sandbox, then all of these values are, are like off by default. Um, and so if you use uh, allow modals uh, and you, you add that to the list, then you can actually use alert and confirm and all that fancy stuff. Uh, then there's the uh, orientation lock and then the pointer lock, uh, which are the JavaScript APIs, and these just simply determine whether or not you can use them. Um, there is uh, allow pop-ups, which is not only stuff for like alert and confirm, but also uh, determines for like underscore blank uh, or uh, underscore parent or whatever, whether or not you can actually do that kind of stuff. And then there is allow puppets to escape the sandbox, which um, if you normally, okay, so let's say you have an iframe with a sandbox and you open a new window uh, through that, then that window will still inherit that sandbox attribute. So it will still apply all those restrictions uh, that you set on the original iframe. Now, if you add allow pop-ups to escape the sandbox uh, value, then that, that pop-up will no longer contain that sandbox. It's for like advertisements, you know, so that their landing page are not sandboxed automatically. Um, yeah, uh, allow same origin means Actually, no. Allow same origin is, I think, one of the most confusing one of these uh, confusing ones of this list because it has nothing to do with cross-domain uh, access so much, but it means that um, uh, iframes retain their original origin. What does that mean? If you use the sandbox attribute at all, uh, your iframe will get a unique uh, origin, which is not the same as any other of the origins on your page. Uh, if you add this uh, value to the to the list of prop uh, to the list of the uh, sandbox attribute, then your iframe will retain its original origin. So it will not automatically be the same. It just depends on what it originally was. I I, I think that's like one of the most confusing ones from this list, but. Uh, allow scripts pretty much just says whether or not you can use JavaScript. So by default, if you use Sandbox, there is no JavaScript, uh, which is kind of interesting, I think, if you like look at most content uh, on, on the web these days, the, the, you know, it just disabling JavaScript that way. Is um, anyways, uh, allow top navigation uh, pretty much means you can't use uh, underscore top as a target. Um, also, you can't use underscore parent. Uh, as a target uh, if that concerns the top. Actually, you can't use it at all. So support for <coughs> support for Sandbox is seems 
pretty okay. But then if you look down to it, there are, there are values for this uh, attribute that are being defined later in the spec. So this, the sandbox may be supported, but some of its values may not be. Uh, and so it's a bit, a bit of a tricky minefield in that regard. Um, and you may have to wait for about five years you know, in order to, for, for things to settle down. Uh, but your mileage might vary depending on what you need. So you know, make sure that you do your research and check whether your targets actually support this attribute uh, value. This is my demo, uh, the demo that I used for testing all of uh, the different values. Uh, there is a row with the different values for Sandbox on its own, then Sandbox with allow pop-ups by default, and then allow forms, and, and both of them. Um, and the only thing I can, I can tell you, the only, my only conclusion here is that the interesting part, uh, parent doesn't work. Uh, if you use Sandbox, the parent just becomes uh, either it, it won't work or you can't target it. Uh, it only works if the top is actually parent. In that case, it will open it in top, but otherwise it will, it will behave as, as if it was new. Or actually, it will behave as if it was blank uh, because all the names are behaving as if they were blank and not so much the old way where they would reuse the same window if it was still open. I think that's an interesting side effect of using Sandbox that you may not be uh, aware of. Anyways. There is no allow full screen because the two mechanisms are use different opt-in systems. So basically, allow full screen is opt-in, whereas uh, uh, sandbox is opt-out, right? Because if you use sandbox, everything is is every restriction is applied automatically, and you can opt out of, of some of them. Whereas for these full screen API, uh, that needs to be automatically applied, and so they they figured let's you know let's not make this. Uh, weird, or even weirder than it already is, and uh, not allow full screen as a value. So you can't use allow full screen uh, uh, as a sandbox value, or at least not, not yet. Maybe they'll come around to it, I don't know. Um, the sandboxes are only applied on navigation. Uh, that means that if you uh, adjust the sandbox dynamically somehow, it will not be reflected on the page until you reload that iframe or whatever content uh, has it. So uh, uh, you, yeah, well, you can dynamically update it without reloading. Uh, there are some bad synergies. One in particular is if you're on the same domain and you have uh, the same, uh, a lot of same origin <coughs> uh, value, uh, then that, the, that, that iframe could reach out to its parent and then remove its sandbox, reload itself, um, and then have an unsandboxed iframe. So there are some cases where you might want to take a look at what you're doing. Next, seamless. I can be short about seamless. Uh, Seamless was supposed to be this, uh, you know, iframe as part of your current document kind of thing, uh, but it, it, it turned out to be uh, difficult on the one hand, uh, obsoleted by certain other uh, technologies on the other hand, and browsers, the one that actually did impl implement it, are retracting it. Uh, it's been removed from the spec. Uh, I don't expect this ever to come back, so don't try to, well, I, I, I would suggest not to invest too much time into this. I was surprised to learn that it actually was removed from the spec uh, when I learned it a while back, uh, I thought it was like this, this, this new thing you could also use. Uh, but nope, you, you can't use it. Uh, there are probably some mobile browsers that still, still work with uh, Seamless, but uh, don't expect this to work. Seamless. Source, uh, the other major rabbit hole. Um, so you can set source in about five different ways. You can use a, a regular URL, of course. Uh, nothing weird there. Uh, the, there are JavaScript URLs. There's the JavaScript colon and then the string kind of thing. Uh, there are you can just leave it empty. Uh, you can use special URLs and then you can use a, 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 a blah, blah, blah. you can use the data URIs. So I'm not going to cover the regular URLs. There's nothing really weird on that one. Uh, the JavaScript one it does does go deep though. Um, it will evaluate your your JavaScript as if it was a regular script tag, um, and then it will use the result of that that script. Um, if it's a string, it will display that string as if it's the actual HTML document, as if you were fetching it remotely. Uh, but if it's not a string, it will serve a 204 no content. Um, what people may think is that you always do it. Uh, well, well, people may think you will always have to do it in like a JavaScript colon and a string. Uh, but in fact, you can just do any arbitrary JavaScript, and it will just work. Um, <coughs> It will require HTML encoding um, on the outer quote that you use in your HTML for the for, for the like for the URL, um, and it will require uh, HTML encoding for the ampersand uh, because otherwise the, the, the HTML parser won't know the difference between the ampersand for uh, es escaping or the ampersand for actual code. Um, 
JS1K used to do this uh, because, no, JS1K used, used to do this because it needed to preserve all demos while still uh, adding a header to the page. Um, and for a long time, it actually used this kind of uh, hack to make everything work. Um, I'm only telling you this because that means that uh, the frames rendered this way will work as if they were regular frames in like you know a regular page uh, because JS1K used the craziest, craziest things around and uh, it, they would still work. So it's, I, I found it interesting that you could do all these weird stuff. Uh, I could inject that with JavaScript into the, into the uh, frame and it will still work. Um, so it's not restricted to, to a string. Uh, these are some examples uh, you can see. And the first one, it just returns a string five, and that will render the five. But then the second one returns the number five, and that will render nothing. Uh, the third one will, uh, the fourth and fourth and the fifth, will just try to, re try to do some simple uh, scripting, um, just as an example that they work. Um, and then the fourth one, if I can see it, sorry, my monitor is flipping. Right, uh, the if else one. So you can have statements there, and if the statement ends somewhat in like a script, uh, a string, it will work. Um, but if you end with a, a statement that's not a string, then it won't work. Uh, and it will work for loops, which is even weirder, I think, because that, I don't know, it has some weird mechanics. Uh, but the, the basics is if you end it with a string, regardless of whether it's uh, an actual uh, statement or not, if that statement ends in a string, like string statement expression, uh, then it will render, and otherwise it won't. Uh, the other weird gimmick here is whether or not the global is uh, accessible. So whether you can actually ac access the global of the target iframe or the resulting iframe from within that URL. Uh, Firefox says, yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, Chrome says, nope. So that's, that's a weird behavior. Uh, ignore the document, right? It only makes things worse, but it was simple to test with. <coughs> so uh, there is a whole spec uh, you can follow. Uh, have fun reading that. It's, it's, it's kind of intricate because you know, there's a lot of steps that go on with having to parse a, par a JavaScript parsing URL um, and running it and results and everything. Um, it's, it's, I, I find it difficult to follow. Um, if you really want to dig deeper, you can. Uh, there is actually, you, 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 can get, you can get way deeper with this whole JavaScript URL. I'm not going to bother you with it because I, I'm afraid that many of you already don't really care about this whole thing. Um, but I... Uh, I really dig this kind of stuff. So, the other way around also doesn't work. If you are in a job in a iframe as RC JavaScript URL, you can't access globals from the parent uh, from the parent uh, or the owner document unless you actually explicitly said parent. So uh, you can access it, but not like directly. Uh, unlike unlike like anchors in anchors, you can actually just access foo as is, um, and I guess that's where the main difference is. You can also specify a data URI and data URIs. Uh, are like the same, they like you did, you know, behavior as expected, um, except for IE. IE says for security purposes, we just don't do this. Uh, we don't allow uh, data URIs at all, and um, uh, they won't work there, apparently. I haven't tested it, so. Um, they are considered cross domain, and that may be weird because there is a race condition in that the uh, owner frame. So, if you do uh, an iframe with a data URI, and in the owner frame, you Im immediately follow that with a script tag, uh, and, you, and you try to read the, the, the iframe, it will read fine. You can access it fine, you can manipulate it fine, um, but it won't be reflected. So, it appears to be accessible while it's not, and that's because if you, if you add a timeout to it, you'll see that you've got security errors uh, for trying to access that data URI. Uh, kind of, uh, maybe not weird, but like if you're trying to test this kind of, kind of stuff and you're like, wait, it's not cross-domain, but I'm not seeing my changes. Like, why is that? Anyways, um, there, are special <coughs> there are special URLs, uh, like about blank and all those. Uh, they, work, they work pretty much fine, actually, and they all behave as if they were about blank, uh, meaning that they are like cross-domain and you can access them and you can do anything with them you want. Uh, there is a special Chrome About link that works in Firefox, by the way, and it will work as if it's a regular link. I'm suspecting that's more of like a fallback if the link isn't supported, just use About Blank. But uh, it will work in Firefox. It won't work in Chrome. Uh, it will just not load it, and it will throw some security error. And then there's the empty pages. Uh, the only interesting one there is that if you set the SRC but don't not the value, and you read out the SRC, you will get the parent URL. Okay. Otherwise, you get About Blank. Um, the last one here is SourceDoc, and uh, uh, SourceDoc is like the JavaScript string, but without the, the JavaScript or the string, um, you can 
add the content as is without having to fetch a resource. Um, and so you, you just simply add the string or the HTML page. The catch is that you have to double encode it um, because you're still inside another HTML document and that parser needs to know whether or not it's parsing content for its own document or it's the source doc attribute. So you do have to double encode it, uh, but it, it will work. Uh, the fallback should be the source, i.e. doesn't currently support, or edge doesn't currently support it. Uh, I, I suspect that they will support it pretty soon. Uh, but they, I read that they will have limitations on whether or not you can actually add scripts to it uh, because they still consider that a security risk uh, similar to data URIs. Um, it's designed to be used in conjunction with Sandbox and Seamless. <coughs> um, I, I don't know. It, that's, I'm not sure how relevant that is for, for them, but it's, uh, um, you know, it works. Um, it requires script text to be closed in order for them to execute for those browsers that do support that. Uh, I'm not sure why that is because I, I would expect it to be uh, uh, I, I would expect it to be parsed in the same way that all the other uh, you know JavaScript URLs are parsed or HTML documents. But apparently there is a difference. So um, it's more lenient. Uh, the syntax is more lenient, or rather the you know uh, like most HTML is already pretty lenient. But you're not allowed to uh, not <laughs> you're not allowed. You are allowed to, but uh, you're not required to have a doc type. Um, it will otherwise, otherwise, I'm pretty sure it will just use the HTML5 doc type. Uh, the title is opt uh, optional as well. You can, you do have to do a body, uh, and it will uh, uh, imply the rest. Uh, yeah, it's a bit anticlimactic, but the, the, the last interesting fact here is that the source will read about uh, source doc and not about blank or nothing at all. And uh, that also means you can't really uh, get that back. Like you can't really read back what the original HTML source was. Um, I'm not entirely sure why they made it about source doc, but I'm, I'm guessing it's just uh, some security error. I, I don't know. So there is um, cross-frame navigation um, in JavaScript, at least. If you uh, uh, if you want to navigate between you know your iframe and its parent frame, or the the, the window and the document and whatever, uh, there's a bunch of APIs that they expose. It's not very consistent, as in the naming, uh, but it does it does seem to work. Fairly good cross-browser, and you can jump from your document to your iframe to your parent to your whatever. Um, I don't know. I, I, I have a handy resource like this handy for whenever I actually need to do this kind of stuff. There are many stones unturned. I have no idea how I'm doing on time, by the way. But uh, there are many stones that are unturned here. Uh, you know, like I said, there, you could have like an entire conference based on HDL or on iframe. Like next year, we should do iframe conf iframe conf, that would be cool. Uh, now seriously, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on in iframes that, that I can't even start to uh, cover here. Um, but if you're into it, you know, go nuts. That is, uh, that's gonna be doing it for me. Uh, that reel that I started, it, it's from uh, another con a conference talk. Um, I think it, uh, it's an important part of the whole discussion there, and I encourage you to look at it. Um, thank you uh, for your attention, and. Uh, Let's have a seat. Ah, yeah. So. <laughs> That's all the questions. Um, yesterday evening, I mentioned to you I was afraid to <laughs> there would be no questions left about iframes. Yeah. And you said, well, oh no, I said no questions left. You said, well, can we travel in time? Can we? <laughs> you ask me whether we can travel in time. <laughs> I wish. No, um, no I don't think so. Um, in the end, if you're talking, to, do you advise? How do you advise using iframes? In what use cases are they preferable? Um, it's really when you want to load external content into your website, um, and then you know once the sandbox uh, attribute actually works as intended and supported everywhere, um, then that would be a good use case. Right now, it's mainly well, not mainly, but a lot used in advertisement where they want to push advertisement into the page, but at the same time don't want to put it on your own page. Um, it's also used for like uh, uh, the, the, the social stuff, like, like Twitter buttons or like buttons or whatever, yeah. uh, so that they don't actually get it on your own page, uh, but they still get all the references and all the, uh, I don't know, all the gimmicks that they want, um, want to have. So if you want to have like a sandbox, even without the attribute, uh, if you want to have like a sandbox, iframe is your, your main uh, go-to. And because now iframes, like the large, large share of iframes you would find is probably kind of misusing them to re reach 
stuff like social buttons, but also more like dark cookie pattern kind of stuff. Yeah, right. Uh, I, I, I don't even know about that. Like, I, no. I'm, I haven't really investigated the uh, abuse of iframes. No. I think that could be an entire new talk. <laughs> sure. Um, and uh, uh, the sandbox is actually uh, the most interesting development right now on iframes, I think. Yeah, uh, well, and the refer policies is, is also uh, being excavated right now. So, yeah, those are the two new developments. And uh, it's going to take a w some time, but once they are actually like solidly supported, that's, that's cool. That's good. Yeah, yeah and, and you mentioned that you still are not able to see what, what, the, what the parent is if you link something from an iframe. And What's the reasoning behind that? I don't know. You don't know. Sorry. Because you're going on for you're updating the spec, and you would s suspect that there are maybe use cases for for I'm quite good use cases for that. Well, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, so uh, the way I discovered it is simply by by you know I look at those values and I'm like okay I can click I can click and then the parent just doesn't work. Honestly, I didn't really dig into why not. The the, the rabbit hole was already pretty deep. So. And 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 and, and how is how are iframes nowadays with responsiveness? No idea. No idea. Sorry, it's not my <laughs> not my cup of tea. Because they they, they, they I think were you can run in quite some problems with with responsiveness or I imagine so. But th these days you can control iframe width and height and and whatever decently. So yeah, uh, it's it's mainly I'm actually not sure whether uh, the 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 frame the child frame gets the on resize event. I haven't checked that actually. That's interesting. Uh, I, w I would expect so though. Okay. But I'm not I'm not sure. I, I'd have to test that. I'm getting my phone because I have some questions from the audience uh, uh, also on my phone. Um, uh, first from a time from Turnhout, he says, like, what security measures would you enable by standard with the sandbox attribute of an iframe? That really depends on your context. I mean, the, the, the main culprits there are the scripts and the pop-ups, right? Uh, but if your content requires scripts, uh, then obviously you can disable scripts. If your content somehow re requires the pop-ups, um, whether it's target blank or uh, uh, even just any kind of pop-up, then you can't just go ahead and disable that. So it really just depends on your content, and you have to be... Um, I, I think you really just have to know what those attributes do, uh, those values do, in order to determine what you need to enable. Okay. Uh, another, I think the last question we'll have is from uh, Lasse Dierks. He says, uh, a question for Peter. iframes are currently the only supported solution to encapsulate CSS, besides CSS module overtooling. What is your opinion about that? I wish they did... Uh, uh, the CSS, uh, uh, what was it? sorry, scoped. scoped. Thank you. I wish they did scoped. I mean, I, I thought it worked, and then, I, then recently I discovered it didn't work. So, I I think that could be solved by scoped, or unless I'm mistaken, uh, misunderstanding the question. But okay, yeah, sure. Uh, well, one last question: What's the Jav JavaScript code golfing competition? What's <laughs> oh okay. <laughs> Um, so in golf, you, you try to uh, get your ball in the hole with the least number of strokes. In JavaScript, in a general, in, in a code golfing competition, you try to write code with a minimal number of characters. And while you can write JavaScript with all your spaces and all your nice whatever long words, you can also make it very short. You don't really need white space in very many cases. Um, you can be smart about certain algorithms, and uh, the whole thing is to write a nice looking demo in about 1024 bytes of code and i think the, the you know previous years have shown that that is very easily doable and all the c c contestants have the same uh, objective exactly uh, well objective um, it's, there's not so much an objective more like an environment they have a, a specific environment in which they all have to use so the, the playing field is even um, you have to do like fairly cross browser compatible and you have a minimal number of uh, of bootstrapping uh, to work with, and from there you have to, you know, you, you have, I think you have a pretty free roam of, of what you can and may do, um, including WebGL, which is not as trivial as it may sound, and including, well, pretty much, you know, anything. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. Yeah. And, and, and where does this, this take place? Or is this on a certain... JS1K.com, yeah. Okay, this is your website, so if yep. other people are here with JavaScript if you uh, If you're join. looking for a time sync, JS1K.com is your... Uh, Okay. It's your go-to, yeah. <laughs> A big applause for Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you.